مشاهدي الاعزاء تحيه طيبه واهلا بكم جميعا الى هذه الحلقه الجديده من وجوه واحداث الصحراء نحن لا نعرفها حق المعرفه هذه المساحات الشاسعه من الكثبان والرمال نراها نسمع بها وعنها لكننا لم نتعمق في دراستها وفي جمع المعلومات الدقيقة عنها والفكرة السائدة هي أنها أراض قاحلة في حالة عطش دائم ولا تتوفر فيها مقومات الحياة في حين أن لهذه الصحاري الصمر قصصا وحكايات كثيرة هذه الحلقة من وجوه وأحداث مخصصة لهذا الموضوع فيها نلتقي بالعالم العربي العالمي المعروف الدكتور فاروق الباز كي يروي لنا بأسلوب علمي مبسط قصة الصحراء كيف كانت كيف أصبحت ويكشف لنا عن الدور الكبير الذي تقوم به رحلات الفضاء لاكتشاف الصحراء من جديد ومن هنا فإن هذا السجع في العنوان الفضاء والصحراء له مدلوله ومعنى فاروق الباز بمشاريع الفضاء متى بدأت هذه العلاقة وكيف تطورت في لقاء خاص به وجوه وأحداث في الحقيقة لقد بدأت في أبحاث الفضاء في عام 1967 وكان ذلك استعدادا لرحلات أبولو إلى القمر وكان أهم الأسئلة حين ذاك هو أين تهبط سفن أبولو على سطح القمر وهذا سؤال علمي لأن المنطقة التي سوف يهبط عليها الرواد يجب أن تكون منبسطة لا تكون فيها درجة ميل ولا يزيد الميل عن 12 درجة لأنه إذا زاد الميل عن 12 درجة وهبطت السفينة انقلبت بروادها وثانيا المنطقة يجب أن تكون أيضا ليست فيها صخور كثيرة حتى تهبط السفينة بسلام ولذلك في هذا الوقت كنا قد بدأنا في دراسة الصخور الصور القمرية قبل ذهاب الرواد حتى نختار مواقع الهبوط على سطح القمر وفي نفس الوقت كان هناك مشروع لتدريب رواد القمر على الدراسات على سطح القمر وكيفية انتقاء العينات وكيفية أخذ الصور وكنت في ذلك الوقت سكرتير عام للجنة المكونة من خمسة أعضاء التي قامت باختيار مواقع الهبوط على سطح القمر وكذلك كنت رئيسا للمجموعة التي كانت مسؤولة عن تدريب رواد الفضاء الذين سوف يطيرون في رحلات أبولو إلى القمر ركزتم الجهود في الفترة الأخيرة على رحلات المكوك الفضائي 
حدثنا عن النتائج العملية التي توصلتم إليها عبر هذه الرحلات في الحقيقة مشروع مكوك الفضاء هام للغاية لدراسة الأرض لأننا الآن نحاول أن نأخذ كل ما تعلمناه من مشاريع أبولو ومن مشاريع المعمل السماوي ومن دراستنا لكوكب المريخ ومن رحلات ال- ال- التي دارت حول الأرض من قبل نحاول أن نجمع كل هذه المعلومات لكيفية استخدام السفن الفضائية في دراسة الأرض وفهمها أكثر ولذلك بدأنا في منذ بداية مشروع مكوك الفضاء بوضع بعض الأجهزة العلمية لاختبار كيفية استخدام سفينة المكوك في دراسة الأرض منها مثلا الكاميرات التي تستطيع أن تأخذ صورا للأرض وكذلك الأجهزة العلمية التي تستطيع أن تبحث في مكونات التربة والصخور على سطح الأرض وكذلك الأجهزة التي تستطيع أن تستخدم أنواعا من الطيف لدراسة النباتات على سطح الأرض وأخيرا أجهزة رادارية تستطيع أن تدرس تضاريس الأرض بأشعة الرادار وفي الحقيقة نتجت عن كل هذه التجارب أشياء مهمة للغاية فأضرب مثلا بالأماكن التي اتضح لنا أن فيها وديان جافة تدل على سريان الماء في الصحراء الغربية في مصر وقمنا فعلا باختيار موقع لحفر آبار للمياه الجوفية وذلك للاستخدام في الزراعة في هذه الصحراء ونتج عن هذا أن هناك سبعة آبار للمياه الجوفية تندلع منها الماء من أعماق تتراوح ما بين 48 متر وتستخدم هذه الأبار الآن في ري لزراعة في الري لزراعة منطقة تجريبية حجمها الآن لا يزيد عن 10000 فدان ولكنها مستقبلا تستطيع أن تتوسع ل 300 ألف فدان وهذه من إحدى النتائج الحديثة لبعض النتائج العلمية لمشروع مكوك الفضاء دكتور الباز ما هي علاقة البحوث العلمية المتوافرة بين ايديكم بما اعلن في الفترة الاخيرة عن اكتشاف المياه الجوفية في صحراء مصر في الحقيقة هذا المثل يدلنا على ان الصحراء لم تكن صحراء في الماضي لان سريان المياه على الصحراء يدل على ان كان هناك حشائس واشجار وعشاب كثيرة واختفت كل هذه الاشياء عندما تغير المناخ ولم تعد الأمطار تهطل على هذه الصحراء ولم تعد هناك المياه التي تسير على سطح الأرض وتكون الوديان وبدأ الجفاف وفي الحقيقة بدأ هذا الجفاف آخر مرة منذ حوالي خمسة آلاف سنة ومنذ هذا الوقت كانت الصحراء تشبه ما هو عليه الآن معنى ذلك أن المياه التي نجدها في بعض أجزاء الصحراء الغربية تدل على أن هناك مياه في أجزاء أخرى من صحراء ليبيا ومن السودان وفي الصحراء الشرقية في مصر وفي سيناء وفي شبه الجزيرة العربية لأن كل هذه الأماكن تكونت في الحقيقة بنفس الطريقة وتطورت بنفس خطوات التطور كانت فيها مياه في الماضي وجف المناخ وأصبحت صحراء وهذه الصحراء في باطنها مياه جوفية مخزونة يجب علينا أن نتعلم كيفية وجود هذه المياه لاستخدامها للزراعة بهذه المناسبة نستعيد بعضا من لقاء خاص عقدناه مع أحد رواد الفضاء الأمريكيين يعرض لنا الطريقة التي التقط فيها هو نفسه بعض الصور للمناطق العربية مع الرائد ووتر كينينغهام. Probably the most enjoyable objective that we had was the opportunity to take uh, pictures in some cases uh, of areas that uh, uh, we had been requested to take uh, by the U.S. Geological Survey or uh, various other uh, entities within NASA. But many of those pictures we took just as a tourist might. Uh, 
if we saw a, a nice scene or one that didn't have cloud cover or something that we had never seen before, we could just take what we called gee whiz pictures. And one of the areas from where we got most of the photographs uh, very clearly was the Middle East. And when you stop to think about it, that's not too surprising because in the Middle East, uh, they frequently uh, are absent of cloud cover. Uh, it's very sunny down there. There's a lot of uh, lines between uh, the land masses and the bodies of water. So we get some very nice pictures. Uh, for example, this first picture that we have here is, uh, is one of the uh, I would call it the almost uh, the world of, uh, of Islam. <clears throat> it uh, shows uh, uh, from an area just uh, starting just south of the Horn of Africa and running right up through the top of the world. You can see the curvature of the earth in the background, so you know this was a picture that was taken from probably at least uh, uh, 16 or 20,000 kilometers out. The first uh, picture is not one that we took on Apollo 7. We never got farther away than about 300 miles from the Earth, so we didn't get this particular perspective. But it's a good way to start off in, to bring into a context some of the areas we're going to talk about. Uh, you see the Horn of Africa running up uh, through uh, northern Africa, the Red Sea. Uh, you can see the Mediterranean. In fact, right up on the horizon towards the top uh, is Europe but uh, Europe is under clouds and you can't make it out clearly in this photograph. You can come down the other side, the Gulf region. There is a slight cloud cover over the Gulf, but you can pick up uh, all the coastline, uh, picking up with uh, Kuwait right on down through the Emirates, down to Oman, Ras al Had, and back around to the Gulf of Aden. <laughs> يروي قصتها قديما وحديثا ويشرح لنا كيف يجب ان نتعامل مع الصحراء وما هي البرامج التي اعدت لاكتشافها في الفضاء الخارجي البداية في الاجابة على هذا السؤال لماذا هذا الاهتمام بالصحراء الاسباب والدوافع Why don't we know as much about these arid platforms as we know about humid terrains and mountain buildings and all of that and the more I thought about it, I thought that the, the reasons must be deep-rooted, and indeed they are. Earth sciences, or the study of the Earth, which we call geology, started in England, actually not too far from here, in Lyme region, and France, and Germany. And Europe is the only continent on Earth that does not have a desert. So the people that started thinking about the Earth and what makes the Earth did not have an example of arid landforms to write about. Those who came after them picked up from what they did, and those who came after those did the same thing. To find that to this day, there are some textbooks in earth sciences or in geology that do not have a single chapter on arid landforms. That is one. The second reason is that the desert is so vast, so incredibly large. There are no very tiny deserts. The desert is just an incredible thing. It, uh, it's many 3,000 miles by uh, 1,500 miles and this kind of uh, thing. And you cannot really study a very small part of the desert and ignore the rest because whatever happens in one part affects some, some other place. The dunes that are now, today, at the shores of Lake Chad started in the western desert in Egypt. So you can't really take a small piece there and say, I'm going to study that. The third reason is the desert environment is exceedingly harsh. You can't very easily move about the desert. And geologists like to fancy themselves as people that go into a place, pick up solid rock, and that sample must be in situ. We have a Latin term for it. It has to be in place before you take a sample of it. And then you mark it, and then you break a piece of that rock and take it to the laboratory, make a thin section, look under the microscope, and they can tell you the whole history of the earth from that one rock. Now, if you go to a desert, there is no such thing. There are no rocks in place or in situ. Everything is a mishmash, broken up rock and sands and, and mixtures of rubble. So there is really nothing that for a geologist to say, well, how am I going to study that? Because it's a mixture of things. And also all of these dunes that all over the place. And any geological field party that goes over the dunes, the cars are going to get stuck. And it is anywhere between 20 minutes and two hours before you can get the car unstuck. So who's going to go into this place and really study it the way we have been studying other things in detail? For this reason, we find that we have very limited amount of information about the desert as compared to what we know about the other types of landforms on Earth. 
Now, the space program has provided us with a whole new tool, something that we did not know before. And because of the same reasons that we cannot really study the desert so simply on the ground, the space provides, for, for the same reason, a whole new vista. First of all, the desert is a desert because there is no rain. So the deserts are usually cloud-free, and therefore you can look at them from top all the time. Any time you can photograph a desert from space. Second reason is that the uh, desert is the, because the deserts are so vast, pictures from space cover very large areas. So you can study a very large area of the desert in one photograph or any type of uh, data. Thirdly, the desert is the way it is because there is absolutely no vegetation on the surface. And that means that whatever you see from above is the natural rock and the sands and the soil. In other humid regions, you get to see an area, and because of the vegetation, vegetation cover, you don't really know how to decipher this uh, terrain, and you don't see the texture and the structure. In desert areas, you see that. And desert areas are also colorful, and the colors are meaningful. They indicate some, loca some percentages of iron, and they locate locations of volcano volcanic rocks, and where are the mountains, and where are the sand dunes, and where are soils and this kind of thing. So the colors are, because they are meaningful, then we can register them from space. So it really is a matter of being able to decipher a little more about the desert from space than we could in, by any other uh, means. الآن وبعد هذه التوطئة يقرن الدكتور الباز المعلومات بالصور التي التقطت من الفضاء الخارجي لكوكب الأرض. What we're looking at here is a photograph taken by the Apollo 11 astronauts on the way back from the moon. After they finished their job, as they speeded up towards the, uh, towards the Earth, this is the way they, the Earth looked to them. And it's a very interesting story that the astronauts used to say that the, the only part of the Earth that they could recognize the, the features of is the Arab world. Because the whole Arab world is a desert, and it is not cloudy. And because of the colors of the desert, as you see them here in the center of the picture, the difference between the reflectance, the reflectivity or brightness of the desert terrain as compared to the dark seas about it is very clear. And that's why they see this whole area. And also, it is not cloudy. All of the whites that you see in this photograph are uh, clouds. The very dark areas in the center of Africa uh, that we see here, all of Africa and all of the Arabian Peninsula and parts of, uh, of Asia. And uh, the, we see the Mediterranean and the Red Sea and the Arabian, Arabian Gulf and so on. So you can see the terrain very clearly there. And this is the, one of the reasons that I showed this picture is to give you a feeling of this business of the color of the desert and the fact that it's not covered by vegetation and the way you can see it. There are all kinds of specks of red and dark and this and that. All of these things have a geological meaning and therefore we can interpret these kinds of, uh, of features rather uh, easily. Now we move into the differences between deserts because when you say a desert, that is not, there is really not a single place that we can call identical desert at all. Every desert is different, in, and all of the deserts in all parts of the, in different continents are different from each other, and the same desert in the same continent in one place is different from the other. We tried to figure out a one way of comparing the deserts to each other, and the only safe way of doing that was to figure out uh, how much, how arid is arid. So we made an aridity index, and that is a relationship between how much energy is received from the sun as opposed to how much rain is received in the same place. So you see the very large area in uh, just west of the uh, Red Sea is, uh, there has a line around it. That line is a contour of 200. And that contour of 200 means that the received solar radiation in this part of the world is capable of evaporating 200 times the amount of rainfall. That is how dry it is. All of the, the, that's the yellowish color in the center. All of the other orange and, and reddish uh, colors in there are anywhere between 20 and 50. And that's why the, the, eastern, the eastern Sahara is the driest place on Earth. Very large zone that is exceedingly dry. All of the deserts in Arabia, for instance, the in Rub al-Khali in, uh, in the Arabian uh, Peninsula, the number for that is only anywhere like between 20 and 30, as compared to 200 aridity in the eastern desert. 
the, the number in the driest place in North America, which is called Death Valley, that's why it is, it is a terrible place, the number for that is seven. So, so it's really a very, yeah, this is how dry. And, and, and it, it, because of this, you can drive in that part of the world for 500, 600 mi miles and not see a single blade of grass, not one. So that it is exceedingly dry and it has not rained there for a very long period of time. What you're looking at here is a mosaic of 65 photographs from a uh, Landsat satellite, which is an unmanned satellite that flies about the Earth, about two, 920 kilometers, taking uh, uh, pictures consecutively, one after the other, and then passing over another zone and taking consecutive pictures. One of the components of these uh, photographs is uh, infrared. And because of that infrared uh, component, all of the water looks black because water absorbs all of infrared radiation and all of the vegetation looks red because the chlorophyll in the plants and the trees and the, the uh, leaves of plants reflects all of the infrared radiation. So that the vegetation here looks red and as you see it, it's only around the Nile Delta up on top and the Nile River or the Nile Valley, which is the area in which that really is today supporting the uh, 40 plus uh, population in, uh, in Egypt and the rest of it is a, uh, a desert. Now, <clears throat> this is a mosaic of the whole area that we're looking about, west from the Nile, all the way to the Libyan and the Sudanese uh, border. I'm going to show you what a thing an individual photograph can show us in detail. Right in the center of that desert are a series of uh, depressions. One of them is called the Kharga Depression, and that's a picture of that. In the, in the middle there, you see a line that separates a lighter area from a darker area. And that line is really a, an escarpment. On the right side, there is a plateau. It's a high plateau, about 900 feet higher than the dark area that you see on your left there. So this area on the right is high, and this area on, the, on your left is low. In between, the zone in between, you can see little fingers in there. And the, all of these little fingers, like veins, all of these are ancient rivers, tiny little streams collecting water from some time when it used to rain down from the escarpment down to the bottom or the valley or the depression. The depression is the darkness of that area on the right side is really due to the fact that the depression is floored by very good soil. And that soil itself is dark and that's why you see that dark color. Now in both areas, on the right and on the left, you can see striations, parallel lines. And, and on, the, uh, on the right side, all of these parallel lines are due to wind erosion. And on the right side, the dark area, all of these long streaks are due to wind deposition. I will first tell you a little bit about wind erosion and then about wind deposition. Wind erosion on the surface, the wind as it, as it, as it moves about the uh, rocks, it can level any hard rock. And as you come to these striated zones, as you come close to them like this, you can see striations on the ground still. When you pick up a small rock, you can see finer striations still. When you look through a microscope, you can see finer striations still, meaning that these striations vary in scales from microscopic structures all the way to huge structures that you can see from space. The <clears throat> way the wind acts is also very interesting. The wind acts without having to be loaded with dust. We used to think, or I was taught, that the wind erodes because of the that because it is dust laden so it is really sand blasting so if you have a solid rock and if the wind comes near it and the wind is laden with with uh, grains of sand then it is blasting this uh, rock with uh, with the sand grains and that's how wind erosion occurs as a geologist the way i was taught and this in the field that's why i thought things were until you really examine this a bit closely and here we're looking at a an exposure of very solid marble in Siwa Oasis on the western side of, uh, of, uh, of Egypt, very close to li the Libyan border. And you see a, a little bit of, uh, of sand coming up, climbing up on the hill. The little dark thing you see in the near field is just a lens, the camera cap. And an interesting thing is that you see there is a depression or a, a missing area right below that uh, piece of rock. And you watch it at the time when the, the wind is, is gusting. And you can see that the wind is carrying the sand up and carrying the sand up. But you, in the same time, you can actually see that little grains of rock are separating from that solid piece of marble at the same time. 
without a single piece of the sand reaching that line. And what happens is that as the wind comes up to the, to, towards the surface of the block like this, which used to be like this, and the wind comes up to the surface and it cannot go no more because it's a physical impediment, so it loops around. And as the velocity increases, that looping becomes faster and faster and faster, so it really is working as an air drill without sand or dust in it at all. And it works on the grains of sand, picking them up, plucking them one by one. And as they, pluck, they are plucked from the rock, they fall down and keeps on happening until you see this shape, until that piece of rock no longer has support and it keels over. It falls from the cliff like the other pieces that you see in the foreground there. It just then it keeps breaking pieces and bits and pieces all the time and creating all kinds of uh, structures like these things that you see in fascinating uh, structures in the desert like this, like a table, like here is uh, something that looks like an ancient dinosaur or a monster. Mm -hmm. Now when all of that is leveled completely, you find that the surface is absolutely flat and what we have is something that we call a desert pavement because it really is a desert driver's dream because you can fly on this terrain after driving for five or ten miles an hour for a long time and you get you come to this area like a desert pavement and you can fly from 60 to 80 kilometers and you'll be delighted and this be, be able to drive like that and what what happens is that uh, you you can see that blocks of rock come on top <coughs> a very soft layer of sand and the way you see it in here as if they are put together by a master craftsman pieces of rock are arranged and they are always one grain thick it's not two pieces of rock on top of each other because they tumble over to each other until they are one grain thick covering the sand and therefore working as an armor and protecting the sand no matter how fast the velocity of the wind or no matter how high the velocity of the wind in this area the sand grains between these rocks are never lifted up because the wind comes on the surface and hits first the rock and moves away hits the rock moves away keeping all of this sand in between the rocks intact now we move into the uh, depositional features of the wind and here we're looking at an enormous bunch of dunes some of these dunes are uh, uh, 40 miles long and five miles wide this is part of the great sand sea at the border between egypt and uh, libya and we call it the sand sea because it's just an enormous uh, accumulation of wavy uh, features the dunes occur in this pattern or individual dunes like that and we understand now that the way these linear or line dunes form as the wind comes in from from one direction in this particular area from the north and it you find an impediment a way something in the way of the wind like a hill the wind breaks up in two components one goes from this side and one goes from the other side and as the two components come back and meet behind that impediment the two regimes disturb each other and the wind starts unloading the sand and I keep going this way growing this one happens to be about two kilometers two kilometers long the other type of uh, dune that affects the most desert areas is the crescent shaped dunes we're looking at one now taking from the air that's about 20 meters wide and these dunes you always learn, know the direction of the wind when you see a dune like this because the wind is always in the direction of the two arms like for instance in here the, that particular dune is moving from upper right to lower left the two arms are pointing towards the direction of movement some of these dunes are moving very fast and by fast i mean the range in this particular part of the world varies between 20 and 100 meters per year that translates to into a foot a day that is exceedingly fast the movement of these dunes affects all kinds of things here is a bunch of dunes for instance one one of the arms of one of these crescent dunes that is starting to encroach upon the uh, desert road that connects this Kharga oasis with the Nile Valley, which is really the only link to civilization, if you will. And we visited the same place six months later, and the dune has naturally moved a little farther out, and another six months, and the dune is, the, the road is no longer crossable. In these particular situations, you can't really do much to it. You have to figure out some other way around the dune and wait for the sand to move out, and then you can reuse that stretch of, of road. And you can figure it out exactly when because we can measure the motion of, of uh, dunes either from successive photographs or going into the field and putting stickers every, every meter and so on and coming back to it different seasons during the, uh, during the year to measure that movement. And here is the way a wind ca can en engulf a uh, telephone line. This telephone line used to be at this level uh, here and had to have an assist so that the, the sand would not uh, swamp the conversations on telephone. 
And it's a very interesting way of collecting dates from a palm tree. And the dunes encroach upon houses like that one here, or a whole village, like this one here called Ginah, in, uh, in the Kharga Depression. And that's a very interesting situation, a very interesting story to this. When we started working on this area, it was about 1972. Uh, this, uh, the, all of the inhabitants of that uh, uh, village had to be removed for some other village nearby because the sand had just covered up and clubbered their little village. The engineers came in, naturally engineers from Cairo, to b build a whole new uh, city for, for the village, for these uh, people. And in uh, eight years, after the engineers did build a new little village for them called Port Said, in the same, only about uh, three and a half uh, kilometers away. And when I visited, revisited the area in 1979, we found that the sand has encroached upon the new village. Not because that is the way in the desert, but because the engineers that selected the site of the new village never really took into account that even though they do not see sand dunes around, the sand dunes way out there will be marching at a given rate here, day in and day out, to come to this place. So that never, nobody had ever thought of that environment. Where am I? What, what is this? Why are we doing? We're moving a village from sand dune encroachment, all right? What is sand dune encroachment? How fast is the sand coming? Where are the sands? Or where do they come from? Has never been thought out. Why? Because in, in that engineer's environment in Cairo, he does not have to take this into account. And that's what I mean by not understanding the desert environment. So now you go into this particular area and you get these space photographs and you work on wood pictures and you work on the field and you work, you find that there is a way of figuring out exactly where are the sand dunes and how fast are they moving, which areas to evade, which areas will be covered by sand in 25 years from today and which areas will never receive any sand whatsoever. We're looking now at the same depression in the middle is the line of this escarpment, separating the high area from the low area. And the low area is the one that has the sand dunes. All of the areas that have tiny little dots, like that, are all covered by sand. And the areas in between are sand-free. Why? Because in the escarpment where the sand is coming from, there is an impediment. Sand goes in there, and sand goes in there, and nothing in between. So this area in between will always be free of sand. If I want to move people from a village, from one area that's clubbered by sand, I will move it to within a zone where the sand will go by on either direction and never coming to them. And we can measure that uh, rate of motion. This happens to be a photograph of the western, uh, western, the northern part of the western desert in Egypt, just west of the Nile Valley. The blue that you see up on top is part of the Mediterranean. The dark green on the right is part of the Nile Delta, and the yellow is the desert. This photograph was taken by the Gemini 5 uh, astronauts in uh, July of 1965. And we wanted to study the terrain because of the fact that there are, you can see, or to the eyes of the specialists, we saw three different zones of color. One close to the Mediterranean that kind of looks spotty and motley, and one right next to it that is rather smooth, and one down in the lower left that is darker. And we went to the geological maps to see the, the reasons for these uh, differences and the distinctions, and we couldn't find any. So we tried to study this area a little bit more, and we also asked the astronaut of the Apollo Soyuz mission, which was in, uh, in July of 1975, to take a photograph of the same uh, area. So they did. Again, the Mediterranean on the upper right, the western border of the Nile uh, Delta uh, out on the right, and the three zones, the darker zone here, a long strip of yellow, and the mottled area in a, in a square, in a triangle near the Mediterranean. That became interesting because it relates to what I said uh, earlier about the, the liberation process from the Tahrir in, uh, in Egypt, because this particular area really lies in the yellow zone, at the border of the yellow zone. Let me just mark this for you. So it was interesting to see how much vegetation grew in this area. So we make the markings, measure the area of vegetation in 1965 and measure the area of vegetation in 1975 and indeed in the Madrid Tahrir region where the agriculture most of the the effort was uh, spent the line has moved very little a little further to the north in this mottled texture area that's closer to the Mediterranean the line moved a lot and this is and well, the reason for this is the fact that that yellow zone is a very sandy zone and the sand there is active. There are no dunes, but the sand keeps shifting from place to place. And the area closer to the Mediterranean is a much better fertile 
soil made of mixtures of clays and carbonates and, and, uh, and so on. So it is a more fertile soil. So if we had this particular photograph, it could have been used as a soil map before the time of the, of the initiation of the project. Just an illustration of how to use these space photographs. A very interesting thing that we see in the desert is that there is a lot of red color, even in the sand. And we have been ascribing this red color due to the oxidation of iron that's mixed in with the sand. What we're looking at is the Namib Desert in uh, Southwest Africa. And the situation is as follows. The dark uh, line on the left side is part of the Atlantic. All of the white that you see are clouds. The area in the center is sand. And the area on the right side, the darker grays, is a mountain range. The wind in this part of the world goes from left to right from west to east. So the wind that comes in from the, over the ocean collects all of the moisture, a lot of clouds form, and then goes over the continent. Because of the mountain, the clouds stop because of the mountains and it rains. That rain water breaks up the rock components and takes them in little wadis and dumps them at the coast of the Atlantic. But the wind still comes from left to right. And the wind picks up the grains of sand farther and farther inland. That's how the sand dunes were formed. As you go inland, you find that the sands are darker in color or redder in color as you go away from the coastline. That's one case. Here is another case in, uh, in Australia, Lake Blanche, near the North Flinders Ranges. And the, the dark, the, the white uh, spot near the center is the source of the sand. And the wind direction in this case is from, from, the, from that white zone all the way to the upper right, to the northeast. And there, are also, there is also zoning closer to the source that is lighter and then as you go further in and in and so on. And we've always attributed this, as I said, to the oxidation of iron grains that are mixed with the sand grains. So we give the astronauts a color wheel with standard Mansell uh, colors. They look at the desert areas from space, from the window, and they read a number in there. They said 10B. And this 10B means that it's closest to the number that we're seeing in there. And then we take that same color wheel and go into the field and measure it, and then go into the photo lab and, and study the rock and, and measure it, the colors, so that we wanted to understand what are these colors, because we found out that the areas that have moved farthest from the source have become reddest, and therefore we will understand where is the source of sand, and closer to the source is the more active sand. That's why we're doing all of that. So we looked at the individual sand greens themselves, and we find that it is not really because of the iron oxides that are mixed in with the sand, but it is because of some coating. All of these grains are supposed to be clean, fresh, bright uh, quartz, which should really shine just like diamonds. But none of them do. And all of them have this yellowish, miserable appearance. And that yellowish appearance is due to the fact that they have co a coating. Each one has a, a coat on top of it. So we take one grain and look at it with a microscope, enlarging it at 1,500 times. And we're looking at just one piece of the grain of sand. And to the, to the, in the lower part is part of that sand. On top is the coating. And then we enlarge the coating a lot, which is 60,000 times. And we can see here individual little crystals of something that has been accumulated on the sand grain itself. And we find that this is a, a clay mineral that has a, puff, a powdery submicroscopic uh, iron oxide uh, material with it, so this is a coating that keeps actually increasing. The coat becomes thicker and thicker and thicker as the sand grains moves away from the source, and that's what, it, what has been giving us the reddish color, and this is how we can interpret where the source area of the sand and which field or which part of the sand field is a little more active and uh, effective. That red color, by the way, is not really restricted to the sands on the deserts of the Earth, but just as well on the deserts of Mars because Mars, all of the planet Mars, can be considered a desert. It is a view of the, the first view of the Viking lander, the first Viking lander mission on, on Mars in 1976, where the first photographs was intentionally designed to take part of the spacecraft in it that has the American flag, because we know the colors of the American flag, and therefore we fixed the picture so that it will come to the American flag covers, and whatever is behind it is real color, and that is the real color of the surface Mars of that reddish color. As we take photographs of Mars from orbit, we can also see that this is the uh, color of the surface, which is very, very close to the colors of the very arid, dry deserts on, on Earth, particularly that area in the eastern uh, Sahara. Here is another ex an example. There, see, this one here was of Mars, and this one here 
is of the border area between Egypt, Libya, and the Sudan. And you can see this same kind of color in the, in the, uh, in the area. What we're looking at are a bunch of mountains. The largest one is called Uwainat Mountain. And there is a spindle-shaped appearance, something that looks like a, a, uh, a, uh, a spindle shape uh, of, of the behind the mountain. The, the mountain is only the dark area up front this way, and then there is a this spindle-shaped area does not have any of this light-colored material that's on, on, on both sides. And this is something that we saw on Mars a lot, and we really didn't understand why, how, why, how it forms there, so we wanted to go to this specific area to, to study it, so we better understand the features on the surface of Mars. So we plan a trip to this place, and we, since we're going to plan to take samples from specific areas and try to locate these samples on space photographs, we took the uh, Egyptian uh, Air Force, took all of our equipment and all of the stuff, and moved, uh, moved us out, landed us in a place in uh, Kharga Oasis, where we had jeeps uh, waiting, and then we start our uh, trek. Now, the best maps of this place that we could use are at a scale of one to one million, meaning one centimeter on the map is equal to 10 kilometers in real life, and that really doesn't show you much at all. That's how little we know about this uh, place, and you could not take a sample and try to locate it in a space photograph from a map that's at that scale. So at that time, we knew that there, is, there are satellites that are moving uh, directly overhead, particular Nimbus 6 satellite, and we know what frequencies it's picking. So we take a transponder with us to send signals to the satellite and prescribe days, uh, pre prescribe times during the day, sometimes three times, sometimes twice a day. We stop the car caravan, and we wait until the transmission is done to the satellite. The satellite picks the, the transmission, sends it over to NASA in, uh, in uh, Greenbelt, Maryland, near Washington, D.C., and the engineers there mark the coordinates of the place from which that transmission came because we wanted to know exactly where we, we are at giving at the time when we took a specific uh, sample. Unfortunately, we did, not, we did not have a receiver, so we could not figure out the exact location where we were at the time. We had to wait until we went back to Washington, D.C. to figure out where we had been. And in the, the most interesting thing about the area, as we see it right away, is the fact that you have anything that is high on the ground has these wadis, old valleys on the side. That is something that wherever you go, you see that in the, this particular part of the desert. These wadis, in their shape, and the way you see them right here, cannot form at all, not anywhere except with running water. So that is an indication of running water immediately, and there is no question about it because really nothing else can form this type of uh, morphology at all. Not on Earth, not on Mars, not in any place. And <clears throat> so we, we, uh, we have been trying to... Let me see whether there's one before that. Yeah. We have been trying to locate ourselves as far as the samples that we're taking, because at the time that we were doing this, shuttle missions were flying directly overhead. And here are two runs of the, uh, the space uh, shuttle mission, one coming from up down and one going from below from Libya down into Egypt and one going from Sudan into uh, Egypt and at the time of the flight of the, of the space shuttle Columbia 2 uh, as uh, going on we were in the desert marking the places where we're taking samples so we can correlate what's on the ground to what is in the space uh, data because it's not very easy to look at space photographs and say aha I see this and this and this you have to really understand better what is on the ground first and take samples and study it so that you can figure this is that and therefore, when I see it again in some other place, I can say that it is the other, the other one. And the, uh, the very interesting uh, result from all of this is the fact that during that same uh, flight, there was a, a uh, side-looking radar. And the radar uh, sent, transmits the radar waves, the radar instrument transmits uh, the waves towards the Earth. And as they get a reflection, all of that is recorded. And the, at the end, you get something that is very similar to an image or a photograph. And we had been planning to take photographs with, radar, uh, with the radar uh, uh, instrument in this part of the desert in the hope that we may be able to see very small features that we cannot see in, in uh, photographs that might indicate better the setting or the texture of the, uh, of the terrain. What came up was something that is vastly different. Here is a, the best possible Landsat image of the zone of interest, or, or one part of the area that we have been uh, interested in. This is really 180 kilometers by 180 kilometers. And if you ignore the two red lines in here, all you really see in the photograph is 
as two very slightly raised areas. All the rest is absolutely flat and mostly sand covered. So we could, you cannot easily interpret this because you just see two slightly raised areas and you don't see anything behind them uh, what's whatsoever or the reason for these two uh, zones. Now the radar, because the area is exceedingly dry, remember the 200 aridity index, there is no moisture there at all. The sand was not re very reflective in radar image, so the radar went through all the sand cover and then was reflected from what is beneath the sand. So we get a reflection from the first solid layer of rock beneath the sand. So remember the two lines, no, sorry about that. The two red lines in this picture was really the, was to show you the border of the, the coverage of the radar uh, instrument. Now as we look at the, in the radar instrument, you immediately learn why were there two raised areas in here. The dark lines that you see in the radar image are ancient valleys, meaning rivers that used to host water at some time in the past. One large one going in this direction, and one going in this direction and one going in this direction. Now we can see this here, because I can, I can take this up this way, I can take this up this way, and that one is in here. That's why there are two little hills. The two little hills were really little islands that were left by the water as it was eroding on the, on the surface. Now, if there was that much water, because the dark area on the right side, the width of that is as wide as the Nile Valley itself, all of it, not the Nile River, but the Nile Valley, 20 kilometers across, meaning that there were rivers as big as the Nile out there. This must mean there was a lot of rain and a lot of water collected on the surface. Some of that water will evaporate, some of it will be lost on the surface and going into lakes, and some of it will seep right through the rock. And some of the water that seeps through the rock will be stored in there, down there. So at the same time that all of this data came up, we knew about the interest of the Egyptian government in, uh, in trying to locate some sources for underground water in the Western Desert for agriculture. So we selected an area that is just south of this picture that we're looking at, which is the confluence of all three rivers. All three of them come to a point, or actually this, this one here and that one come down this way, which means it is the area where the likelihood of finding groundwater would be most because this is a river comes here, river comes in. Also, this is the area where they meet would be the area where there is more of that. And indeed, within a year and a half only, where the last time I was in this place, which was less than uh, half a year, they had drilled seven wells, and all of the seven wells brought in water. من الأسئلة التي يطرحها الفضول البشري كيف يمكن تغيير وجه الصحراء؟ مفتاح الإجابة لو استطاع علماء باطن الأرض الحصول على مصادر للمياه كما كان وضع الصحراء من قبل. Going back to the to the uh, the uh, dry valleys in all of the high areas, and we're looking at one of them. In many of these cases, we find that these valleys have or these channels, the wadis, have been blocked. And you can see this is a blockage by sand. It can be blocked by a volcano. It can be blocked by a rock rubble, or in this particular case, in a sand. To take this picture, I'm standing on one side of the, of the uh, wadi, and there is the other side that you see, and this wadi is rather huge. The two white dots you see in the middle are two geologists. So this is a very big wadi, blocked, <laughs> blocked by, by uh, sand. And wherever we see this blockage in any of these wadis, we see lakes or indications of lakes upstream. And the indications are, for instance, that the depo deposits, lake deposits, in this particular case, up to 24 feet thick. And if you have a lake deposit that is 24 feet thick, that means water was there for a very long period of time, depositing the silts for a very long period of time to form this much, because lakes really deposit at an exceedingly slow and very uh, scarce rate. There are other indications of, of uh, life in the place where you find all of these little circles. And wherever we go into the desert and find these circles, we find that they're houses. And they're always in circles, or remains of houses, never in squares. So square architecture really came with the ancient Egyptians on the Nile boundary. The ha before them, the desert inhabitants used to make circular dwellings by 
uh, association we find that this particular area here is about 6,000 years old. And why, why by association? Because of the things that we find around it. Let me see whether there's one before that. Okay, no. By association, here is something that the archaeologists call the core rock, from which is a very solid, tough rock, from which the ancient human inhabitants would chip pieces of it to form their tools, knives and things and things like that, like this. And this bunch in here varies in age between about 8,000 and maybe 180,000 years ago. And you move into this desert, as I said, that you drive there for 600 miles and not see a single blade of grass, and you see this thing which is a milling stone and a grinding stone. That indicates there was grain. Grain for, could be collected and put into this thing and to make flour. Because how can you make grain here unless there was a lot of greenery, water, and a lot of life in there? You go around and you find a great deal of ostrich eggshells. Here is one, almost the whole thing, ostriches. This particular one is dated to about 8,700 years ago. So it's quite a life when you think about an ostrich in this place. You can think of a lot of grasses, savanna-like environment where the ostriches had to eat the, the grasses. So it, 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 the ostrich could never live in an environment like this today. And, uh, oh, here is a very interesting situation where we have the, uh, the uh, a ostrich eggshells taken out, made little circles made out of the, uh, of the fragments of the shell, and little holes made into the... Uh, and we actually saw the instruments where they make this thing, and little holes made through the, the circle, and then make that into... Yes, so jewelry is not an invention of modern man. And the most interesting of all of these uh, leftovers remains are the petroglyphs, the drawings, the paintings inside caves that you see encounter in this uh, particular, uh, in, on, actually in all of the high mountains in, the, uh, in, in North Africa. This particular one is in Wainat, and what you see is a, a, an incredible number of uh, giraffes and baboons and the, the, those artists that drew these things could not have drawn them from memory. They had to have these kinds of creatures around to, uh, to see them and draw them. الآن مع مزيد من التفاصيل عن كوكب المريخ وعن أوجه الشبه بين هذا الكوكب يعني المريخ وأراضي الصحراء الشرقية. Now we <coughs> get back to the question about the feature that look like Mars, and I would really like to show you some illustrations of the things that are very similar between the Martian landscape and that landscape in the eastern Sahara. Went back to this uh, picture in the mountain, uh, the Awainat mountain at the border between Egypt, Libya, and the Sudan, and they will show you an illustration of uh, something that looks very much like the tiny little rock on the upper left, which, which, which is in Libya called Hagar El Garda. This is a little hill that has a, another spindle-shaped area around it. And that's Hagar El Garda is out on the left side of the uh, screen. A little hill up there, and behind it is a, is a, a spindle-shaped area. And we found out that that spindle-shaped area is a sand-free zone. All of the sands are just on either side, and that's why we see the white on either side. And in back of the hill, there is absolutely no sand, so the dark ground that is not sand-covered is what we see here. On the right side is almost an identical situation on Mars. Rather than a hill, there is a crater in the way of the wind, and all of the stuff around it is material that has been carried by the wind, and the dark area is the original surface of the rock on, on Mars. Another illustration here is in the, uh, on the left side, is part of the, the uh, desert in, in Sudan, and, uh, which is southeast of, uh, of uh, the Awainat mountain, and here we have a whole bunch of hills on the way of the moving wind, and as the wind moves between the hills, it leaves lines behind the hills, and so you get this streaking appearance. On the right side is an area in the Cerberus region on Mars, you get the same kind of appearance. So it is a matter of a natural part of the environment where you have rocks and wind and sand. When we first received a photograph of Mars, which is on the right side, we saw that this area must be the result of a, a drastic situation. Something must have happened here to mix the types of rocks. We thought that this must have been either a flood or an impact crater that created this kind of scene. And what is that kind of scene? The scene where we have very large rocks, middle-sized rocks, tiny little rocks, and friable material all around. That environment is not really in the, in the humid parts of the earth, is not very, very easily uh, formed, unless there is a, something catastrophic that would form that. As I said, in a flood, a turbulent flow, or an impact by a crater, as happens on the moon and so on. However, 
when we go into the Western Desert in Egypt and we see the same kind of setting formed in, in, in a natural way whereby rocks just as they decompose, some of them decompose differently because of local concentrations and local compositions and it's not really part of a, 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 of a, of a catastrophic event, it's part of the natural setting on the, on the terrain. Very similarly, when we first saw the picture on the right side, on Mars, we immediately said that this is uh, vesicular basalt, a very specific type of volcanic rock that we know well. We have seen it in many places on Earth, in the Deccan traps in India, in the northwest of the United States, in Egypt exposures. There are all kinds of exposures of that, of that volcanic rock. And it is vesicular because as the volcanic lava comes in from the ground and it's loaded with gases, it gets to the surface and it's chilled very quickly. The gases have no, no, no time to escape, so they get trapped, and they get trapped in pockets. And so the rock has a spongy appearance because there are trapped pockets of gases all over the place. And that's what we see on the right side. However, on the left side, we see an illustration of a rock that has nothing to do with volcanic activity in the western desert of Egypt. And it has little pockets in there, but these pockets are just on the surface. They were formed by, by the erosion of the wind. As this wind comes in here and makes a little pocket here and a little pocket all over the place, so that the one on the right did not have to be volcanic uh, vesicular basalt that can be any type of rock that is just so formed by wind action. So all of these kinds of things tell us a great deal about the environment that we did not know about before. And all of the correlations really I wanted to make in the point of in here, the correlations between the surface features of Mars and the surface features of the Eastern Sahara, which is the driest place on Earth, is to just give you a flavor that the, the nature, the, 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 the desert is part of the natural environment because that desert of Mars to our knowledge, was created without the presence of a single man or a single goat. So that, that it formed by a natural process on the surface of, of Mars, and this is the way it has developed on the surface of Earth. It changed and evolved through history, but it is partly part of the Earth and its setting, and we must really better understand it so we can utilize it for our benefit. Thank you. وبعد هذه هي بعض الفصول من ملحمة الصحراء العربية التي لا نعرفها حق المعرفة وهذه هي المحاولات الجارية لسبر غور الصحراء من الفضاء الخارجي نأمل أن تكون صورة الصحراء قد اتضحت أكثر ولو قليلا إنصافا للصحراء المضطهدة وتعرفا إلى المزيد من الحقائق العلمية الجديدة في عهدنا المعاصر تحية طيبة لكم جميعا وإلى اللقاء في حلقة جديدة من وجوه وأحداث